Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Everybody had a good night last night? Are you excited about uh, day three of the Me Convention? How about a big round of applause for the organizers? This has been fantastic. So uh, you guys know how to use the Slido app by now to ask questions. We want to make this panel as interactive as possible, so we encourage you to ask questions throughout this session. It's going to be about 45 minutes. You probably know this from the description, but the fashion industry is the second most polluting industry in the world. We're going to talk about that today, and we encourage your conversation on Slido and online. And joining me now is the moderator for this session, Liz Vassilar, and her panelists. A big, warm welcome. Be cozy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, we're so close to one another. Hi everyone, good morning. I'm gonna leave my phone. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of a controversial introduction. Don't freak, just stay with me here. And remember, I'm a New Yorker, so I might use some foul language, but you know, just stick with me. We're gonna go to a nice place. I, I, I know you are here because you care about sustainability. You care about change. Uh, you care about brands reacting to this call to action that consumers are giving them right now. Some attribute them to millennials. I would like to take some credit for that as well. I'm right on the cusp. I'm not quite sure if I'm a millennial. But I want to tell you that from the industry point of view, because I work behind the scenes with the decision makers, with the heads of those brands, sustainability, it's a bunch of bullshit. It's a buzzword. Okay, this year there have been a record number of brands around the world that have been launched at Fashion Week with the claim of sustainable and eco-friendly. And they do that because it sounds good, because it makes them feel good. But if you look behind the hood, there's nothing really there. It's just very timid attempts on this topic. It's not real sustainability. But here's the problem, what's real sustainability? Right? The standards are a little murky. It's hard to really understand uh, what you're supposed to really be. And all fashion really knows is that they are under attack. If you think of e-commerce, they're making things really hard. If you are a brand, a nice, wholesome, or a legacy brand, you see a luxury brand, my gosh, you see that e-commerce is looming in, possibly growing. And then you have Amazon on top of it, making shit more complicated, because now you have to figure out a way to deliver things in the speed of light, and that just goes against the topic of today. But that's what they're up against when they look at their boards, when they look at their growth prospects. So is sustainability good for the bottom line? Absolutely not, they say. They can figure out a way to grow profits and abiding by all this few good stuff that we want them to do. But don't fret. These things are changing. Right now, I point to these two guys, Eileen Fisher and Patagonia, and I tell you that they are the leaders out there. Of course, we have Stella McCartney as well, but those two have been consistently talking about it and delivering it, talking about it and delivering it. They, they jumped on circularity in a way that no other brands have, uh, taking the, the, the prospect of taking clothes, they're out there, recycling them, making them come back to us again. And they, they're pushing boundaries in a way that it's data-driven. You see the results and the commitment is real. You are asking for provenance. I'm putting this slide out there because this is a startup that has emerged uh, a long time ago. It was actually born uh, in one of my hackathons. I haven't explained who I am. I'll do it in the next slide. And they didn't really matter. I remember seeing when they came up to be in 2013, looking at them and as a consumer feeling passionate about provenance, about explaining where things came from and how they came to be. But I knew that for the industry at that time, they didn't really matter because all this conversation didn't really matter. But right now in 2017, 
they finally have a shot. They came back at it. Now there is blockchain, a technology that allows them to grow even further uh, with the system of ledger, the system of record keeping, that you can not say things, but transparently prove things. And I believe the provenance now has a real shot of growing and becoming a big tech company. So you are asking about this topic. Now you are, Everlane started that in the US by showing stories that was how a garment has been made and the pricing structure. This, this costs $100 because 20 came to this, 30 came from that. And that transparency, it's something that is resonating. Suddenly them, uh, Everlane, uh, Reformation, they have proven that you can achieve growth with sustainability approaches, sustainable approaches. And that shit looks cool to millennials. They react into it, it's reverberating on social media. So now, brands that I've, and for the past seven years, I've been working with brands all around the world by connecting them, them with technology. I created a, the largest fashion and tech series in the world called Decoded Fashion. It's spread to 12 countries, 20,000 people community. And I've always tried to talk about environmental issues, but my, uh, my promise to them is that I'll always bring innovation that creates growth. And I couldn't quite figure out a way to deliver innovation approaches on sustainability that creates growth until now. So today, I'm very excited. I can't quite disclose all the things I wish I could tell you. I'm working on incredible projects that have to do with sustainability, that have to do with environmentally conscious, using technology. You know the bio leather is here to stay. Watch that next year, 2018. It's gonna be the year that we talk about uh, bio textiles. I've seen them, I've seen them last week. And, and it's not the one that you have seen the name out there. There's another player and, and this is all good for the market. So a lot of what I can tell you, it's next year. My message to you that I haven't been able to do innovation sustainability for the large brands up to now because it hasn't mattered, but you made it matter. You changed the conversation. And from, on, from here on, I'm quite excited about the things that I'll, I'll be able to show you on that topic. So following me are the ones who have been able to do a lot uh, until now. So please welcome uh, to the stage our next presenter. Go ahead, Amber, I think you're next, right? This video? Oh. The mics are working in their headphones. Oh. No, it's right, thank you very much. So I'm gonna keep this really brief and just wanna give you guys a quick overview of a program that we work on at Patagonia called Warnware. But for some context, in the 43 years since we started Patagonia, population of the planet has nearly doubled. The global economy has grown 500%. I think we are all pretty clear on the impacts on our natural systems, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions, ocean acidification, chemicals that our kids are born with that uh, should not be persistent in their blood, and, and, and. And so what we believe as a company, the most responsible thing we can do is build product that lasts and give our customers an opportunity to keep it in use longer. And so one of the things that uh, we're pretty well known for having done is challenging our customers to reduce their consumption. In addition to reducing their consumption, we've also created ways for them to repair their product, to reuse it at the end of the, the natural life for them with the product. And then if there's no additional value in the product at all, finally, as a last step to recycle the product. So I'm gonna share with you a quick one minute video that kind of pulls this together. Whoops. I'm not gonna share with you a quick one minute video that pulls this <laughs> together. Uh, I'll tell you what it says. It talks about uh, the four R's as we see them in the OneWare initiative. It talks a little bit about the platforms that enable that. One of the platforms is repair. We run North America's largest global, uh, largest apparel repair center. We do about 50,000 repairs in that facility alone. We've also got mobile repair trucks that we take to events around Europe and around North America. I think we had about 100,000 visitors to those uh, repair events last year. We've also partnered with a group called iFixit to provide free repair guides to our customers so that our customers can do simple product repair themselves. The newest initiative on reuse is a platform called oneware.com where you can go to, you can come into a Patagonia retail store, you can turn in a product from Patagonia that may have life left in it, but that you're finished with, and we'll give you a credit towards a future purchase of a new or a used piece of apparel. 
and then we will launder, repair, and then resell that piece at a, at a greatly diminished price. And then finally, as I mentioned before, we take responsibility for 100% of the product we make at the end of its usable life. You can bring it back to us, and we'll be responsible for recycling it. So despite all of the work we've done through Warnware and a lot of other initiatives, the money we give away, the activism we support and otherwise, it's really important to note that while we may be a responsible company, Patagonia is not a sustainable company. We, sustainable really implies that we would be giving back to the planet as much as we take, and we have got a really long ways to go to make that happen. Um, currently, as humans, we're using one and a half times the resources the planet could provide. In America, it's closer to six times the resources. So, long ways to go towards uh, a pathway towards sustainability, but our goal is Patagonia, above and beyond providing inspiration to other companies and voice to activists, is that we're a company that's here in 100 years, living on a healthy planet and servicing healthy customers. Thanks. Wait. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm going to introduce you a project called The Library. It's a sustainable fashion archive where we revive iconic pieces throughout history uh, and we revive them using sustainable material. But wait a second, <laughs> why am I doing this? Um, I was born in 1982 and I feel like I've seen the earth change, the climate change happen in, my, in front of my very own eyes. Um, I'm a displaced uh, person from Lebanon. I moved to the US at a very young age, came back to Lebanon after the war ended and I had seen the cost of war both on the environment and on, on society and on a human rights level. And this really prompted me to do something about it. Why did I choose fashion? Although we all know fashion pollutes, <laughs> fashion is not something that is sustainable, it is, but it is a medium that could um, create social change in a way, and I will explain how. I started Slow Factory in 2012 um, as I was seeing the earth from, a, from an airplane uh, since, I'm, since I was uh, two, four, five, six, seven, every year, we had to move from a place to another. And watching the Earth from that level, I felt uh, a sense of peace. I felt like this planet deserves a little more help and a little more love. And uh, this awareness brought me to working with NASA and understanding the overview effect, which is what the astronauts feel when they see the Earth for the first time from space. Slow Factory is a design and tech lab. Uh, we use fashion as a medium for social change. We uh, started the movement called Fashion Activism, and uh, I'm gonna just show you a little bit about it. So the fashion, the Slow, fa the slow Factory model is very simple. We work with sustainable material, recycled fibers, um, natural fibers, um, uh, from waste to garments, fibers, we take them in our factory, we create products that carry meaning, that carry action, that um, raise awareness about uh, the work that we uh, want to raise awareness about. Oftentimes we, we partner with NGOs and the money we collect, we bring it back to the NGO, bring it back to the production and, and that's how we've been going. Um, so what we do is basically 100% eco-friendly um, and sustainable products that we can stand by, fair trade manufacturing, empowering artisans, and then products with purpose empowering people. We made this dress. Um, it shows an image from uh, Greenland uh, that was taken by Terra Modis, which is a satellite that takes pictures of the Earth during the day. Um, it shows how the, the iceberg is breaking at a considerable rate. 13% of ice cap is uh, being, uh, being melted throughout the, every year. We made these uh, before and after shoes, um, before and after walking step by step every day as you are being aware of what's going on, using again NASA images in a very simple way just to get people to embody the causes. Recently, we partnered with ACLU. Uh, we printed the First Amendment in Arabic on a U.S. flight jacket that we're, that we're selling on our website. Those jackets are made in the same facilities that produce U.S. Navy garments. In the inside, we have the First Amendment written in Arabic, and we're raising awareness about the ban. We also printed a band scarf, which is the Middle East, North Africa at night, as seen from space with the word band on it, depicting the seven countries that uh, the new administration decided to ban. We ran that campaign. 
We also printed a refugee shirt uh, that's made out of 100% recycled plastic bottles. We also made this key that's molded out of the key of my own home as a symbol of displacement. Wearing a key around your neck is a tradition that started with the Palestinian tradition when they first came to Lebanon when they were displaced. And I wanted to honor all of refugees um, as I really believe that um, the environmental impact that are, we are creating is causing the refugee crisis that we are seeing. The library's model is very similar to the slow factory model, except we mainly focus on turning waste into fabric. And I will show you how. I'm wearing a skirt that we're making with 19% uh, of recycled plastic bottles into denim. And this is a shirt uh, showing <laughs> uh, melting glacier. <laughs> Again, another image from NASA on a sustainably sourced silk cotton blend that we're printing in Brooklyn. The library is, re is reviving six iconic pieces that have changed the course of history, from the mini skirt that I'm wearing, 1968 French Revolution, to the hot pants, 1930s, to the jumpsuit. Uh, we decided to really empower people and giving them meaning and showing them history of where their clothes are made and how and why. Uh, using cutting-edge tech, we're working on waste to fabric because we believe this is the new luxury. Our we are a network. Uh, from our network, we count Thread International, our partner. Uh, it's a sourcing company that works on creating these textiles. I'm a Media Lab Director's Fellow, and I focus my research on new material. Uh, we work with Oslo Freedom Forum on our mission and the Fashion Tech Lab Fund, Mira Slova Duma's initiative. We are a bridge. We connect eco-material to people. We're also a system collecting recycled items from customers and turning them back into products. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, OK. <laughs> Let me get to the top. So briefly, um, I'm from Oklahoma. And my mother was a bit of an activist. She helped stop a nuclear power plant from being built near my hometown on American Indian native land. And I saw my mom's activism and was very inspired, but I didn't completely understand it. What I did understand is that I loved being outdoors, and every weekend I was at my grandparents playing on their farm. And I knew that my values were one that I love the natural world. And my mom always taught me to fight for what I believe in. So that's the kind of the basis. Cut to a almost 30 year modeling career. And um, so I'll give you a little glimpse. We're not going forward. This one. Green. Yes. yes. There's two green buttons. <laughs> um, so I've, I've done a lot of iconic work in the fashion industry and um, had a great time doing it. But along the way, I could feel a disconnect from my values and my work. And some of you might know me from some TV and film work. Um, and my job as a model is to sell you an ideal life, you know, a fantasy. And um, I felt that disconnect. I knew about the environmental issues we were facing, and, and yet I still needed to work. And I still do t t today. Um, but I realized that the fashion industry has an amazing opportunity to be one of the global leaders in sustainability and real change in, in how we produce and manufacture everything, not just fashion. So I decided I wanted to be a part of that, to match my values to my business. At, and this is a clip from The True Cost, which probably many of you all know. Image. So the idea is the influencer. If you hire someone like me, a valued influencer, I'm here to help you express your values as a brand, but also to engage the consumer so that they feel an authenticity when we talk about sustainability. And with that idea, we came up with this idea called triple branding. So a brand that wants to be responsible or sustainable 
hire someone like me, a valued influencer who lives and breathes their values and tries to do the best they can. And then you add the product story. And then all three, we have an, an educated consumer because I get to help you express your values and we tell the story of a great product. Responsible brand, responsible product, better world. Um, in 2013, I started an online company selling fashion and accessories, all sustainably made and responsibly made, and I partnered with ukes.com as the platform. So it was the first uh, attempt for me as an entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur to prove this point that you can be both sustainable and stylish. We were live. And we were telling the consumer to buy better because as we mentioned earlier, nothing is perfect. We haven't completely solved this problem in sustainability and fashion, but we believe we can do better. Another example of what we were doing, we were selling beautiful handmade bags by Vivian Westwood on Master and Muse. I'm just gonna skip forward a little. These are all just um, examples of what we did. I teamed up with H&M uh, and their Conscious Collection, and we sold that on Master and Muse. Knowing um, what we know today, we know that collaboration is key. And collaboration meaning expressing our values with each other, sharing information, sharing data, and also working with NGOs. So we work with people like Fashion Positive, uh, Made in a Free World. And we want to empower the consumer to make change, to do better, to understand that where your power lies is where you put your, your dollars. And we can create change this way. These are just more. Um, well, we'll talk more about what we do, but um, a responsible consumer is an empowered consumer. And my job as a valued influencer is to help get that across in a fun, sexy, accessible, meaningful way. And I'm looking forward to speaking to you. Do you need that? Thank you. Okay, the discussion. And I encourage you all to continue submitting your questions on Slido. I see them popping up. We're going to get to them for sure. But first, we have on one side the empowered consumer, the connected consumer. Um, some like to attribute all of this to millennials. Uh, I love Will I Am's view of screen agers because I'm definitely on that club. I'm a screen ager. Uh, I've, do you agree that right now there's a crescendo of emotions that suddenly are preparing these this messages that you've been talking about for so long to the forefront? Do you feel that this, this feeling of displacement that was like a theme of Fashion Week in New York, this feeling of uncertainty, which is a theme in the, in the United States for sure, you guys know why we're suffering out there, uh, and in Europe, have been making us look and look towards environment and sustainability and a search for meaning beyond ourselves more than before. I Anyone can, can I'll jump start on it. by just saying, uh, if you use the word fashion, I've probably got the least to offer of anybody here at the table, so or <laughs> on the couch. So I'll just speak about um, the outdoor industry and maybe sort of the sports space that we work in. I think the concern that we have, the good news is people seem to be much more aware and conscious around issues of sustainability. I often say that in Europe, it's a decade ahead of where it is in the US as a general statement, and that I think is how And why people, do you say that, Brian? I just think people, it's more deeply ingrained. People are more thoughtful, they live in smaller spaces, they use public transportation differently, they don't drive uh, large trucks um, to the grocery store that's a block away, which are all pretty standard US behaviors. Um, but I think that 
The, so the good news is people are more interested, concerned. I think that they are, perhaps contrary a little bit to your point before, I think they're starting to make purchasing decisions with brands that they believe have a level of authenticity and commitment. The concern we have in our industry is that it's a fad and that as quickly as it comes on, it goes away. And I think that would be, you could argue, more damaging than it never having become on trend. Got it. And Amber, for you, when I was saying earlier um, about hasn't mattered until now, it was coming from the approach that until the heads of brands, executives, really believe in it, it's really hard to make a, a large impact because they are driving a lot of the negative impact on earth and they have so much power. And you work with some of these brands, brands that we love, mm -hmm. brands that we look to them and we really waiting for the moment which they will jump in the bandwagon. Yes, I mean, I think the, the luxury sector, especially the um, brands that kind of mark the trends, they have a responsibility to change their, um, the way they produce clothing and the way they sell clothing. Um, but they are part of the problem, of course, but a lot of the luxury brands are doing much smaller, you know, batches of clothing than say a fast fashion company. But the thing that we need from them is that they are the trendsetters. And so it's, believe it or not, I don't actually think that that many people are that informed about the issues. And so we just have to keep talking about it. We have to keep meeting with leaders in the fashion industry, sitting down with brands, creating opportunities that are interesting. You know, creating, because everybody wants to tell a story and everybody wants to find a concept. and. Fashion thrives on ingenuity and innovation. So if we bring the innovation in with the materials and the design, and we bring in the creativity with the storytelling, then I think people will buy into it and it'll be long lasting. Because they'll also see that it's, it's about the bottom line. The bottom line gets better when you do things sustainably and responsibly. And when it becomes on trend, it's a powerful marketing tool. It is, but then we can go past the trend. It's something, we have to stop looking at it as a trend and we have to always have to talk about it. We don't always have to talk about it. We need to be designing everything we make, everything we make in a circular mentality. It has to be good for the earth <clears throat> or it has to be recyclable or it has to have another life process. It's just smart. It's cool, it's modern. It's, it's, I don't even know, to me it seems, it seems asinine we're still having a discussion about how we make things. Like, aren't we trying to be 21st century? And you as know? I want to transi transition to Celine, um, I want to build upon something that you have said, that we focus a lot on the environment, which is crucial, but there's the human side of it as well. Absolutely. What do you have to say about that? Um, the human side is, it's a very big issue and it is not a joke. And the problem is, is that the more demand, you know, the consumers are putting demand for cheaper, the stores want more and faster and cheaper. And though these factories are trying to do better, a lot of them feel the pressure. And so they put pressure on, on how they produce. And so working conditions aren't safe and people aren't being treated fairly. Not to mention you have a whole nother level, which is very, you know, dark and, and heavy, which is, you know, slave labor or child labor, which is another level to the issue. But the fact that people aren't being treated fairly or, uh, and not having safe working conditions, it's, it's incomprehensible. And, and the problem is, is that we don't have, you know, enough laws set in place and trade laws and governments, you know, get scared in these smaller countries. And if you take all their business away, then they're stripped of financial security. And then they just go somewhere else and do it somewhere else. So we, we all, you know, it's a global issue that we, the more transparency, the more data we share, the more we make it an issue with consumers and brands, the sooner and quicker that the whole system will change. It's a systematic issue from from when we buy or how we, how we produce raw materials all the way to the very end to how we advertise on my end. And I would go even further on how to, uh, when, when, how do we discard garments and when Absolutely. do we, where are we sending them and where yes. are we dumping our uh, 
disposable items that we've bought, um, I would just want to echo what you're saying, that over 50% of workers are not paid the fair wage. That is discarding the idea that we're not even looking at uh, slave labor. Um, I think that, you know, we, we need to move past the guilt if yeah. we want to if we want to embrace more customers i think that since 2011 people are were starting to embrace the idea of buying fair trade in at least the food industry the food industry has been an amazing example they always that ahead they, they are ahead yes <laughs> but because people can relate faster and like oh i'm putting this in my body where in fashion you're putting this on your body and you you care a little less about it and it takes a little bit more effort in changing culture and changing behavior on that on that front and especially what we focus on is really shifting from guilt into desire mm -hmm. how can we turn guilt on its head when we know all these facts it's it's known we we just don't want to advertise it you know we talk about it i personally write in teen vogue constantly about fashion inc the the cost of fashion uh, what's behind the scene trying to educate the cus the customer but always we try to bring it because we get a lot of questions like what what should i do how should i purchase better and and I feel so guilty going to H&M, but that's all I can afford. And that's the reality also is that um, there isn't enough offering. There isn't enough uh, out there that, 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 has, um, uh, you know, that can compete with the prices that H&M is offering. And part of the democratization of culture in uh, sustainability and in fashion, we need to offer something that is uh, competitive in prices. And that doesn't mean uh, someone has to take the cost. Um, it just means we need to, to create a system that works better. Mm -hmm. And there are ways and solutions we can work on that. We have, a, we have great examples. For example, Everlin is not 100% sustainable and it's not 100% transparent. I would have to argue with you on that. Mm -hmm. But it is a great example on how we could offer something that is affordable and that is transparent. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Their to approach to, mm -hmm. to transparency was, I think, one of the first steps towards this gaining momentum. You were between being a manufacturer and a brand, and as Amber and many others uh, talk about the topic, sustainability, it's not something that's regulated. So where do you start? Like, what, what part of it do you tackle, right, to your, your jacket? I don't know if your jacket is real leather. It is real leather. It's so, vintage. It's a problem, right? It's a problem. Uh, Stella McCartney is really against yeah, it. Yeah, but and, it is against it. But, but then polyester fake leather, leather also exactly, is not it's also good, a problem. So, yeah. so well, how do we handle this? And I would have to argue with you, like, guilt-tripping people is not the way to go. No. Uh, when we approach people, we want to inspire empathy. And when you inspire empathy, you really have to approach it in a very, um, I would say, uh, respectful manner, in a respectful way. People buy leather, people buy uh, polyester, leather people buy uh, things from various fast fashion companies that I'm not going to name because that's all they can afford yeah. and because for them fashion is a self-expression tool that's why we're in between brand and manufacturing um, there are ways like Patagonia is doing a great job in uh, educating people on mending their clothes. Mending our clothes, it's something that was completely lost in the 50s, 60s, when actually everybody wanted to just throw away things and just buy more and buy more. And this overconsumption is capitalizing on the insecurity and the fears that people have in their own, with their own selves, as all human beings do deal with fear and insecurity, we have this industry that complete, like that is just capitalizing on all of this. And uh, we want to go back to our, um, to our roots in a way. We want to go back to what's real and mending our clothes is a big movement. There's also Stella McCartney who does that. There's also Vivian Westwood, who's the mother of all this like uh, mend your clothes movement. I would you, say. you don't want to name, but I'll name it. Uh, so Ryan, <laughs> I'm coming to you. H&M has a beef with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you launch your campaign about circularity, buy less, even the jacket, don't buy this jacket, um, you really aggravated them. And uh, their CEO said that by buying less, like Patagon is telling you to do, you are creating an increase of 10 to 20 percent in poverty in the world. I haven't Ryan. heard that quote, but uh, <laughs> a couple of things. I, I I'll fire back and say I think fast fashion is fundamentally evil. Mm -hmm. I think that creating demand within people to buy product more often than they need and and making really low quality product that goes, you know, that's why I was talking before about repair and reuse 
and reduce before recycle, this notion that it's sustainable to buy more than you need, use it longer than it should perform, and then turn it back into H&M and it'll be recycled and somehow that's energy neutral or positive, it's a bullshit statement. And so I think, um, I, I think fast fashion, as I said, is, is fundamentally evil. I think there's a responsibility, and I also think there's more clothing in the world than there is a need amongst all of the people, which is true of the food industry as well. Mm -hmm. We just haven't built, because we don't seem to have the incentives, the mechanisms for getting food like clothing to the people that most need it and evening it out. I think for us, the ad that gets quoted quite often, and I showed the picture, as did you, of don't buy this jacket, was not, I mean, the, the headline was to get attention. But if you go back and Google the text, it's the block text at the bottom that made the point that we were trying to make. But if we had put it at the top, no one would have stopped and looked. And it says, these are all the things we do to try to minimize the impact of the creation of this piece. And at the end of that, it still generates this much greenhouse gas emissions, uses this much water, and spins off at that time, this was, I think, six years ago, two thirds of its weight in waste. And we, we didn't know how to do better, and that was still the impact. And so the message was, before you buy this jacket, or any jacket, or any pair of pants, just think, do you actually need it? Mm -hmm. And if you still want it, then make an educated decision about what you're gonna buy, buy quality, figure out what you've got that this might be replacing in your closet at home, and what can you do with that? Can you get it to somebody else, or, or what are the options? But I think that was the message. How can you create growth being so responsible? Right, when, as, and I forget the few good stuff, looking at the business, the hard code business here, how can you stay black as a business and by telling, by asking consumers to consume less? Um, have you been able to increase your margins? Have you been able to drop prices over the years because of technology? It's a, a broad question. I'll say a few things. First of all, our founder and owner, Yvonne Chouinard, has said many, many times, and I think he thought it was just this hypothetical statement, and it's now butting up against reality, that he's never met a billion-dollar company that he likes, and we're about to be a billion-dollar company, so he now owns one. And I think it puts a lot of responsibility on all of us to make sure that the company he owns is a company that he likes and is a company that he's proud of. I think one of the things that's been really interesting for us, and, and I say interesting because we wrestle with this quite a bit is the fact that we have grown significantly in the last five, six, seven years. And I think the thing, you know, going back a number of years, Yvonne and, and his wife Melinda really wrestled with, should we just sell the company and get out of the apparel space and create a foundation and do large scale conservation? And they wrestled with that for a long time. What they ultimately decided is the company can be a vehicle in ways that just getting out of the industry would not allow them access to for inspiration and leadership. And the whole, the whole thing really really is an experiment. I think to your question of how do you, how do you manage that, we give away 1% of our revenue every year to um, small grassroots organizations working on issues that we feel are very important around the planet. Um, we gave away $10 million on Black Friday last year, which was 100% of our revenue globally for the day. We're very outspoken on issues that we feel are important. We create a lot of content. Uh, we're working here in Europe on, on a project. How do you grow giving so much away? Uh, well, growth and profitability are two different things first. I mean, I think that people, I think they understand there's a level of authenticity with the brand and they respond to that and we appreciate that very Stick much. It creates stickiness and loyalty, right? Yeah, I think people also appreciate the fact that we try to be very transparent. You know, I said we're not sustainable. We're absolutely a not, we are not a sustainable brand. Our goal for the future is to use no virgin materials in, in the entirety of our supply chain, but we've got a long ways to go. Our goal is 100% fair labor certified production. So we've got a lot of goals that we're working actively to, but I'll also tell you, and you can Google it, you know, we've had issues in our supply chain in Taiwan. We've had issues with animal treatment down in uh, Argentina, I think it was two years ago. I mean, it's on and on and on places that we've struggled and what we've tried to do through our website and other tools is create transparency. And these are the things we'd like to do. This is where we're proud of the accomplishments, this is where we hope to go, and this is where we're stumbling. And Ember, here's the last one before we turn to the audience questions. Fast fashion is evil. And then through your lens of collaboration, working with H&M is mm -hmm. something positive. How do we bring this all into harmony, right? They have yeah. so much power, uh, them and Topshop and a few others, um, to be able to push messages out there to emerging generations. 
but still there's so much resistance. Yeah. Well, first I just, I want to say like what Patagonia does and companies that are big like Patagonia, coming out of that perfectionistic paralysis and being willing to be imperfect and stand up and say, we've made a mistake. Like Ryan just said, we've had some issues is an enormously courageous and impactful uh, message that that's what brands need to be doing. Stop trying to be perfect and just start doing something. Who cares about the PR reper repercussions? It doesn't look authentic anymore. Well, exactly, but that's what makes people buy. People want an authentic brand. That's why Patagonia is successful. So to your question about H&M or, or the fast fashion companies, the main reason I, I partnered with them was because we were doing the conscious collection, obviously. And I thought it was an opportunity to get the message of, of responsibly made conscious clothing out to a big audience. Unfortunately, the problem is, is that fast fashion is what it is. Though I know they do a lot, they do a lot to, you know, for energy conservation, they buy a ton of uh, organic cotton and they, they take, have a take back program. They do a lot, but the biggest issue is that the production, they're producing too much. As Ryan said, it is fundamentally wrong. And that is the problem with fast, fast fashion. So if they all slowed down and made the price point perhaps the same and made sure their labor practices were fair, but you slow down and just don't sell as much, don't make as much, it would be revolutionary. Like people would buy and I, I would think they would, their margins would still be great. There was a recent study that showed that the impact on labor practices if prices were increased by $4, $4. Yes, I mean, it's so minor, some of the changes that we need to make that would make things more fair for either laborers or for the consumer or for the brand. If we would just make subtle changes, it would change a lot. It's just the fact that we're motivated, all of us, by fear of not having something, you know, filling that gap, which I talk about in, in, an, in another part of my life, but filling that void. And what is that void that we, I think is Patagonia is actually asking you, stop and question, why do you need it? And so, you know, my, my hope is that we will slow down enough to see why we need it. F fashion is fun and it's expressive and it's creative and I love doing what I do and I love making women feel good about themselves and that they're excited to get dressed, but not at the cost of someone else's life or well-being or our planet's well-being. And that to me is fundamentally why we have to change because it's not fun anymore. It's starting to have this heaviness of guilt and and um, disparity. And I feel like you, the audience, um, you, you hear listen to this talk for various reasons. And I remember being you years ago, listen to sustainability talks, and I wasn't really acting as a consumer uh, in that manner. And over the years, it's becoming harder for me to ignore, becoming really harder. I'm thinking of each purchase I made much harder now. And hopefully that will be the case with you all. So Celine, jump on that first question. Most consumers make clothing choices based on the cost rather than personal values. So how can sustainable fashion become a little more affordable? And how do you approach uh, prices when you launch your items out Absolutely. there? Absolutely. I just want to add something uh, before we, we, we get onto this question, that there's always the economic uh, uh, counter value or the ar economic argument that if we slow down, we're creating poverty to the point that you mentioned earlier about what H&M had said. And they are creating poverty themselves by uh, exploiting, um, uh, you know, foreign foreign workers and and uh, cheap labor, and that exploiting of these. Uh, societies is what is creating poverty. It is not by slowing down. Mm -hmm. And that argument needs to be looked into carefully and to the point of price. Now, 
again, most consumers make these uh, make purchases based on cost. I would against argue against this because there is data showing that 74% of people rather pay a little more for a company that meets their values. And that's like a recent study. It, got, it has gone up from 24% to 55% in 2013 to right now it's at 74 or 78 percent so this is a false statement that people rather pay less just because they're going after cost and um, instead of paying a little more how can we meet them in something that's affordable again buying something it, there's a whole shift in our understanding on how we are to buy when you buy something that's cheap you the cost per wear is about seven times so you wear it you wash it you wear it you wash it seven times later you're giving it away to a charity and that is a that is a real data when we look at the cost per wear you're actually not paying less for your garment, you're paying more. Uh, you're paying less when you buy something that's just a little bit more expensive. Was a rental. That's going to <laughs> exactly. That's going to last you a lot more. Or do something like rent the runway, or go buy secondhand, or do some vintage shopping. There are so many options out there. There's so many options rather than going and buying something new that you're looking for, uh, buying something that's not expensive. If you are on a budget, go secondhand shopping, go vintage shopping, go rent the runway if you have a good event. There are options out there. <clears throat> If you're looking to buy something like an investment piece, we like to say, uh, a pair of jeans, if you're buying it at under $50, you're going to wash them seven times, 13 times, and then you're going to give them away because the elastic is not going to last or the seams are not going to last and you're going to end up giving them away. When you give away clothes, they end up in Africa, they, they end up in Vietnam, they end up in third world countries that don't need your clothes because it's hurting their local economy, it's, it's hurting their local markets. These countries, thrive on local artisanship and they do not wish to buy something that's broken or they don't know what to do with them. They're out there on the streets and they're creating pollution uh, in their countries. So here's another one. Thank you. Um, this is from Jaron. And I'm going to change it a little bit, Jaron. How do we stop Primark like stores? So Primark, Topshop, H&M, Forever 21. Uh, I was going to say it, but I said it. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say something. Let me know if you, th if you think I'm on the right track here. Not how do we stop it, how do you stop it? Because it was really incredible to me when I was hinting uh, in my introduction that this brand that I love, and it's a brand that all of you know, a uh, luxury brand, um, has told me how they wanted me to focus all the innovation technology sourcing that I do on sustainability for them because there has been a lot of social media inquiry by you guys to them about this topic. And now it's rising all the way to the CEO level. So you have to understand that this is not something that you show up to talks and expect speakers to deliver the solutions. You are driving this yeah, in this age of social media. I mean, Donald Trump replies to regular people tweets. I know, I said his name. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That hurt me too. <laughs> um, your voices are being heard. In this age of Uber communication, global communication, your voices are being heard. So I don't think it's up to us. I think it's up to them. All of us. I mean, I think it's both. I think it's both. I mean, the, the consumer needs to demand change, but if they are not educated about the issues, then it's hard for them to ask for something different. So I think we as influencers or as uh, thought leaders and, you know, creatives all have to keep talking about these issues um, and about fashion and about design in general. But then as brands, uh, especially the luxury sector and hopefully the fast fashion sector, they have to do it no matter what. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a part of their message or marketing campaign, but it can be. Um, but they need to do it. And, and it's just, we don't really have any more options. Our natural resources are being depleted and, and we all know it. I mean, it's like repetitive talk. It's just people are still acting like it's not happening. So. It just, it needs to happen, it needs to be cool, it needs to be fun, it needs to be sexy and, and accessible. Accessible meaning good price points for, for people so that they can buy in. Totally. So Ryan, a question. You guys are clearly the gold standard um, on seeking out responsibility and how about regulation? Uh, when we look at the auto industry, mm -hmm. we look at them in the eye and say emissions. You need to pay back for emissions. Mm -hmm. And we are, if you look at on the human side, the number one uh, culprit 
for wrongdoing and on environmental side, the number two. And still, no one asks the fashion industry any questions yeah. on the regulatory side. You know, I'm conflicted there. I mean, the first thing I would say is if governments want to get into the business of creating standards that all apparel companies have to meet, we would certainly embrace it. I, I personally, and this is not a Patagonia position as much as it's my own, I've given up on the big issues of of protecting us on this planet. I've just given up hope in, in governments being able to do that. You look at the COP21 process and everybody is slapping themselves on the back for the progress that was made in Paris two years ago. And the reality is it was 20 plus years in the making and it didn't do very much. And so I think the issues that plague us, whether they're equality and for the people that are making product or they're the bigger issues of sustainability. I think the solutions are going to come from individuals. I think they're going to come from individuals working as cooperatives. I think they need to come from business. I, I'm modestly encouraged that in a really fucked up political environment in the U.S. right now, one of the sort of silver linings is that you do see CEOs of publicly traded companies starting to offer opinions on issues, social issues and issues of importance. And so uh, I would say the balance, the scale is still tipped grossly in the wrong direction, but at least you're starting to see that. And perhaps that's, you know, a little bit of a sea change for the future. But again, you know, there's the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which many footwear and apparel companies are a member of. And I think if governments worked with them to try to figure out what standards were and they had real teeth to them, that would be fantastic. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath. And we feel like we, I feel like we're living in such dark times right now that any good message that a brand, a corporate puts out there and this topic rises to the surface because we're trying to hold on to positive emotions because it's drowning. We're all drowning right now. Well, you don't, As change, Americans. <laughs> you don't change necessarily in positive times. You change when times are the toughest. That is when you have the most growth. So though we are all feeling quite fearful and heavy and frustrated and all of those things and, and probably disenfranchised, I think actually it's a time of great change and motivation. So, um, you know, I, th I think it's... It's a great opportunity to grow as individuals and collectively. I could have not ended on a better note. Thank you so much, Amber, for that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Feel free to... That was fantastic. Thank you so much for such a thoughtful conversation. I know the feedback on social media has been great. I've been following along on Twitter, and uh, you guys should check it out after a lot of comments. Uh, maybe you didn't even see on Slido, so thank you so much. All right, so we are back in this room in just a few minutes for another session on brand as platform. So hopefully you'll join me back here. We have an amazing afternoon at the Me Convention. Who's sticking around for la later on for ASAP Rocky? Raise of hands. All right, so we'll have a full room later on. We have lots in between, so I'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Thanks so much.